Well, good morning to everyone. If you would open in your Bible to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 90 this morning. Psalm 90. This is a psalm that was written by Moses as a title to it. It says, The Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Moses is said to have written both Psalm 90 and 91. In Psalm 90, I want to bring your attention down to verse 7 in particular when you get there. The topic that I'm going to be speaking on this morning is, in, is called the, the Wrath of God. And Moses addresses this in this particular psalm, having witnessed these things with his own eyes, having seen the plagues descend on Egypt, having seen God deal uh, in judgment against his own people who were rebellious toward him. And in verse 7 he says this, For we have been consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we have been dismayed. Thou hast placed our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy presence. For all our days have declined in thy fury, we have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain seventy years, or if due to strength, eighty years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of thine anger and thy fury according to the fear that is due thee? Now, if you would, I want you to turn to the book of Nahum and take another look at this particular topic through the eyes of the prophet Nahum. You'll find him toward the back of the Old Testament. Nahum's entire prophecy deals with the ancient city of Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And in verse 1, when you're there, he writes this way, the, the oracle of Nineveh, or the burden of Nineveh, the prophet carries a burden with him. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way. And clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all is the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. And now one more passage into the New Testament, the book of Romans, the first chapter. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul this time will speak. Romans 1, verse 18. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that's our text for this morning. Now, when you read these texts, there's one thing that stands out in particular that all these three men, Moses, Nahum, and then the New Testament, Paul, are dealing with, and that's a, a topic called the wrath of God. And to me, I think one of the saddest things that I've seen transpire in recent years in the church is the, and I'll just use this word because I don't know a lack of, I don't know another word that sums it up any better, is the perversion of God's character that we see nowadays in modern society. It's an unfortunate but true is that the very concept of the wrath of God is held open to ridicule today in most circles. You know, those who would you know, promulgate such notions are viewed as backward, uh, as antiquated, as ignorant, as uh, trapped by superstitions, as closed-minded, 
bigoted, whatever you want to use the expression, those who hold to such notions in today's sophisticated or enlightened world are viewed in that, in that capacity. And what's really sad is that even in the churches today, the topic, the wrath of God, the subject, is more or less glossed over. It's not spoken of too often anymore. From time to time, God raises up men who will speak about it, and they'll speak about it boldly and without shame, even though they're being held open to ridicule, but they'll speak about it. But what's really sad is that in place of the wrath of God, in place of you know, the God that Moses spoke about, who Moses spoke to God face to face, knew him quite intimately, the God that Nahum spoke about who judged Nineveh for its crimes of wickedness, and the God that Paul spoke about, in place of that God is more or less a God who is of a benevolent nature, who is passive, who views the affairs of earth as almost as a, a spectator, when tragic events happen, has almost had nothing to do with it, has more or less caught him by surprise or wished he could have prevented it or somehow didn't. And in other words, more or less God is incapable of doing such things as inflicting wrath down on the human race. When the judgment descends on humanity, it's not viewed oftentimes anymore, in, in at least in the United States, in broader circles, as an act of God. It's attributed to everything but God. And I think it's pretty sad because in the place of that we have a God who is all love and all mercy. And I think when you read Nahum, Nahum brought out a pretty good point. He's speaking about a jealous and avenging God is the Lord and he speaks about how God reserves wrath for his enemies. But right in the midst of that, which is a pretty serious description of God's character, one of the strongest ones in the Word of God about God, the wrath of God, Nahum says the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. So both sides of God are presented there. God was willing to open his arms to bring people to himself, to wrap his arms around them, to shelter them, to comfort them, to bring peace you know, to their hearts. There's that benevolent deity. There he is. But right alongside that is also the wrath of God. It is poured out on those who would mock him, those who would insult him. And the destruction that befell on Nineveh was pretty cataclysmic in nature. When you read about how the Babylonian horde swept over Assyria, which was the greatest world power of its day, and reduced it to nothingness. Pretty amazing how an empire of such size and such power and might and strength was completely overwhelmed and its capital city was destroyed. But nonetheless, it happened. And the interesting thing is that when you read the Bible, you read not only of God dealing with his own people in judgment, but you really about him dealing with other nations in judgments, nations other than Israel. And Paul, when he gets in Romans 1, he's looking at the Gentile world of his day. In, in the first chapter there, he's speaking about the Roman Empire of his day and speaks about how God's wrath is being revealed from heaven. And the point is, this is very simple. We have, a, we have produced, as a result of this perversion of the nature of God, we have produced a society at large that has no fear of God. There is no fear of God. This is exactly what Romans chapter 3 says. At one time, uh, our nation could be said to be by far and large a God-fearing nation. That would have been a, a pretty good description of the United States. It was God-fearing. That doesn't mean everybody in the nation was saved. It doesn't mean everybody was Christians. But it did, did mean that people had a sense about them of a deity who was bigger than themselves and who could inflict harm and who would do that. You read about those. It is, I find it ironic almost to think, to look at the way insurance policies were written, uh, act of God. You know, to talk, to, to talk about something terrible that would happen, act of God. I would say that insurance policies are closer to the truth than many pulpits today. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Pretty sad commentary. You know, and nobody likes to talk about these things because it seems like it makes you callous uh, or insensitive to human suffering when you speak about these things. And I don't think we are to speak about it. I think it behooves us to speak about this to try to prevent further suffering or further human misery. You know, without, without a warning being interpreted, men don't know how to respond to it properly. Like Paul said, he was speaking about in the Corinthian church, if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, how are you going to take a warning? Well, that's unfortunately the trumpet sounds and the, the, it's not interpreted properly. But here's the point. Look, the scriptures speak about God's character. Let me show you something about this. Go, go with me to Psalms, the book of Psalms, and go to chapter 11. Let me show you something what it says about God's character here. And I want to, I want to bring this out for a moment. Psalm chapter 11, 
And look down at verse 7. Just one little, one little uh, sentence out of here. Psalm 11, verse 7. It says this, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. You see what it says about the Lord? It says He is righteous, therefore He loves righteousness. The same thing can be found in Psalm 33. Let's, let's flip there in a moment. Pay close attention to that. He loves righteousness because He is righteous. Psalm 33. And you'll see a, re a repetition of this idea in verse 4 and 5. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. So he, there it is again. He loves righteousness and justice. Now, righteousness is a moral concept. Both places we've seen, Psalm 33 and Psalm, Psalm 11, says God loves righteousness because He is righteous. That's a moral concept. Now listen, if we're going to accept the fact that God loves righteousness, then we must by logic conclude that God hates the moral opposite. In other words, if God is righteous and therefore loves righteousness, then logic dictates that His nature must hate the opposite of that. So if he loves righteousness, therefore we can say he hates iniquity. He hates it. Now, that's not a strange concept because the saints of God, the Christians are commanded to do the very same thing. They said, ye who love the Lord hate evil. That's a command to us. It's in the psalm. And Peter picks that up in his epistle. He quotes it right out of the book of Psalm. Ye who love the Lord hate evil. So, love for God means by result, by logic, that you hate that which is opposed to God. In other words, there's a moral repulsion to it. That's what God's character is like. In other words, because He's righteous, He loves that which re reflects His nature. But that which is in opposition to His nature, He hates it. So now, let me show you this. And this is brought out back in the book of Psalms, chapter 7. Let's take a look at it. Psalm chapter 7. And I find this a remarkable passage in, this, in the Word of God, something that you don't hear too often nowadays. Now, verse 11 says this, God is a righteous judge. There it is. There's that righteousness again. Now, the corollary is this. That's in the, the, the next phrase. God is a righteous judge and the God who has indignation every day. Because God is righteous and He's a just judge, therefore His nature is indignant at evil. He's opposed to evil. It's indignant to Him. It's something that is offensive to God. We use the expression, like Paul tells us, and basically in Romans 12, to loathe evil. Loathe it. Now, the best way I know how to describe this, and, and, and again, not to be too graphic, but if you've ever gone down a road and you've seen something that was run over by a car, and it's you know an animal, whether it's an opossum, an armadillo, whatever it is, out there in the road, and it sits out there for a few days, and it begins to bloat because you know the, the, the gas trapped inside of it, and the maggots. It's, it's repugnant, repulsive. And I'm trying to make this description somewhat graphic, but it is repulsive to us, isn't it? You look at it, you go, oh, I mean, the smell, the sight, everything about it repulses us. Okay, now why is that? Because that's something in our nature. It's as offensive to us. Now, however, when we talk about God, that's, that's what we were trying to get across. Because God loves righteousness so much, evil is repulsive to him. It's repulsive. Okay? And eventually, what we need to understand, the, his nature, because it is repulsed by evil, and because it's a just God, and it's perfectly righteous, therefore, he will inflict wrath upon evildoers. He will punish evildoers. Hey, if we remove that concept from God, then I've got to submit to you, we have removed the very reason for the gospel being having the gospel. It's gone. Without the subject of the wrath of God, you have no need of the gospel of Christ. Nothing. You don't need it. Okay? But when Paul is speaking in Romans 1, he immediately, and we're going to look at this in a moment, he talks about God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel, but then he talks about his wrath is revealed. So in other words, 
The reason that he has revealed a righteousness in the gospel is so that we may be delivered from his wrath. Now, Jesus primarily comes to save us from the wrath of God. Not to give us victory over a personal problem that we have. Not to help us live a better life. Not to help us have a better marriage. Not to help us have be better parents. Those are all good things. I'm not denigrating those. We all want to be better parents. We all want to have a good life. We all want to have be good, you know, good husbands, good fathers, good wives, good mothers. We want those things. We want to learn how to deal with our neighbors. Those are all good. That is not why Jesus came. He came to deliver us from the wrath of God. Okay? And the, 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 the very fact that we have minimized or glossed over the topic of the wrath of God means that we have in one sense removed one of the main reasons for people believing in the gospel. If you do away with the concept of the wrath of God, then you lose the urgency of conversion. There's no, there's no need for it. Well, take your time. Maybe when you get old, you can accept Jesus on your deathbed. Whatever. There's no rush. But i got to submit to you, when you read the preaching from previous periods, you can read it not only in the Word of God, you read the way the disciples preached, but when you read people like George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards or Azahel Nettleton, I mean, all these guys you can read from the past, or they read the Puritans, I mean, read, read them. Their concept was the wrath of God is real, the gospel of Christ is needed, Christ comes, believe on him, be saved from this. You know, I think about that Philippian jailer when Paul and Silas were there and they were chained in that dungeon. And of course, that wasn't a very pretty place to be. And at midnight, it says the place shook and their chains fell off and the terrified jailer, you know, what must I do to be saved? He was terrified. And well, he should have been. And it seems something like that. Imagine the earth shaking around you and the, and the chains falling off your prisoners. And imagine the impact that must have made on someone. But he was terrified. You know, I think about John the Baptist as he preached to the Pharisees of his day. Flee from the wrath to come. He didn't say to the Pharisees, Pharisees, you have need of better marriages and you have need of better family lives and so I want you to come and listen to my preaching because I can help you. It's not what he said. That was a serious man dealing with a serious topic. And it was his duty as a prophet of God to warn those people. And even though it might have opened him up to ridicule, and eventually it cost him his life, you know, wicked Herod got tired of him saying those sort of things. He had the power to remove him, so he did. And eventually God dealt with Herod too. But the point was, I mean, John the Baptist's message was dealing with the, with the wrath of God and how people could escape it. I mean, that's the mercy of God saying, here's a means of escape. Lay hold of it and be saved. And people scoff. But the point is, is, is in this is that when you read this in Psalm 7, it says God has anger, his indignation every day. That's a remarkable expression. And so no wonder Nahum says the Lord is slow to anger. I mean, think about ourselves and how quickly at times we can become angry when something offends us. You know, and remember we were told to be imitators of God as dear children. We ought to be long-suffering. Well, God is definitely long-suffering because if he's angered every day or he's provoked every day by the sin of humanity, the very fact that he has not destroyed larger portions of the globe is attributed to his long-suffering and his mercy. He has every right to, but he doesn't. He's a merciful God. He's a long-suffering God. He is a God of mercy. But what, what I'm concerned about is that in attempting to cry up the mercy of God and the love of God, we completely minimize the wrath of God, and therefore, again, we, prevent, we present an imbalanced character of God. Now, let's go back to Romans 1 and take a look at some things back there. Romans chapter 1, because I want you to see the context in which this is written. Now, Paul, Paul says this. First in verse 17, he has said it. He says, for in it, he's speaking about the gospel because he says he's not ashamed of it. In verse 17, he says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Everybody see that word revealed? That's important, okay? Because 
It's the same word in the next verse, verse 18, where it says the wrath of God is revealed. Okay, now, first, so he says two things are revealed. Number one, in the gospel, what is revealed is the righteousness of God. But he says the wrath of God is also revealed. The word reveal is the word that we get apocalypse from. The apocalypse. Ever heard you know, people have used the title of the book of Revelation, the apocalypse? Okay. The word that we, we term apocalypse can also be translated to reveal something. That's why the book of Revelation is called Revelation. It's revealing something. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show those whom, you know, is how it goes, I think, in verse 5 of chapter 1. It's an apocalypse. It's a revealing of Christ. It's, it's a, like taking curtains and pulling them back and showing what's behind it. And so when Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, he says there's an unveiling takes place. There's something that is pulled back and this nature or this attribute or characteristic of God is revealed. So let's take a look at this and, and break this down in detail. It says, first off, it says, for the wrath of God. In other words, it's personal. The wrath of God. It's not the wrath of nature. It's not the law of cause and effect. It's the wrath of God. It's personal. It's something that belongs personally to God. And it's revealed, which means it's made clear. It's made manifest. And where is it revealed from? From heaven. And what's it directed against? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In particular, a group of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So, to show you something, this concept of the wrath of God occupied a large part of Paul's thinking. In other words, it seized upon Paul. Can I use that? It, it was like woven into the warp and woof of his thinking. Paul, when he viewed God, he viewed God not only as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful, loving God, he also viewed God as that same God back in chapter 11 of the book of Psalms, a righteous judge who has indignation every day. One place in Psalm chapter 5, it says, the Lord hates all those who do iniquity. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Now, but Paul's concept of God was one of, he understood God was a God of wrath, like Nahum. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. To show you how large a portion this occupied Paul's mind, let me just show you in a couple of books how often Paul uses that expression. And just in this book alone, look how many times he'll repeat it. I'm not going to show you every occasion, but here in chapter 1, we just read about it, the wrath of God is revealed. Turn to chapter 2. Look at the next chapter. Look at verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up, looks at, wrath. You are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what can they expect? Wrath and indignation. Okay, now we go to chapter 4, the same book. Just jump one time, just keep looking. Look at this, verse 15. To show you how, how this occupied his mind. Verse 15, for the law brings about wrath. See it? The law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. Jump down to chapter 5. Look at verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. There it is again. Go to Romans chapter 9. When you get there, take a look at verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known... Now, that's a remarkable thing He just said about God. He's willing to demonstrate His wrath and make His power known. He's willing to do that. He endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. There it is again. Concept of the wrath of God. In Romans 13, you don't need to turn there. He talks about the, the magistrate being the instrument of God's wrath in the earth. That's the authorities when they punish evildoers. He 
called an the instrument of God's wrath. Okay? Take a look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at that. 1 Thessalonians 1. When you're there, take a look at verse 10. We're just going to... Well, read verse 9 as we get this sentence. For they themselves... 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There it is again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn over there. Verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, it's a little bit of weak translation in New American Standard. King James is stronger. It says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. Now, that is an amazing expression. Now, watch what he says. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You see, what was his motivation for persuading men to come to Christ? The terror of God, the wrath of God. That was his, that what drove him on to rescue them from the wrath of God. Not that they could have a better marriage or relate better to their neighbors or have better family lives or handle their finances better or cope with this problem or that problem. Again, those are legitimate. But that's not what the heart of the gospel was about. That's not what motivated Paul. Paul's motivation was, we know about this judgment seat. And we know that everyone will stand before and they will be recompensed for what they've done. Either good or either bad. And he says, because we know that's a solemn day, we persuade men because they will face there the wrath of God. And so we persuade them. That was his motivation. And look, let me show you this in Acts 17. Turn over there for a moment. Look at this again. Here's what drove him on. Acts chapter 17. Here I was just jumping in the middle of his sermon to the, the sophisticated of the age, the intellect, the, um, the intellectia. I can't even say the word. Thank you, intellectia, intelligentsia. Thank you. Okay, here it is. Look at this. He's speaking. He says, verse thirty. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all men everywhere should repent. Why is that? Because He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There it is again, the judgment day. See how what he's talking about? So in other words, just by reading the book of Romans and going through there and seeing how many times he speaks about the wrath of God, just by looking at the book of Corinthians, by looking at the Thessalonians, we can go over and over and go through every single thing that he wrote. And you see this theme keeps cropping up. Peter the Apostle says the same thing. His first sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he tells the Jews there, he says, be saved from this perverse generation. So he tells them, be saved from this perverse generation. And then he quotes on the quote from the book of Joel about the last days. He was warning them about the judgment that was going to befall them, which eventually culminated in their destruction in 70 A.D. with the ruin of Jerusalem. So he was warning them. And Jesus himself spoke about that topic all the time. He spoke about the wrath of God. And it's remarkable. Sometimes when you read the Gospels, you'll find more references from the mouth of the Lord to judgment and to condemnation and to hell and to you know, wrath, that sort of thing, than you will about love and mercy. Those are words from the Lord Himself. It's a somber thing. So in other words, this topic that we're speaking on, the wrath of God, was something that you could find no matter what portion of the Old Testament or New Testament you go through, it's there. And it's such an important, it, it occupies such a significant place in the thinking of the writers of the Bible that it's amazing to me that it's been almost, it's seemingly carved out of the minds of this generation. It's almost been removed. 
And, I mean, leading ministers are afraid to speak about these things now for being ridiculed. Yeah, and they maybe there's a sort of thing, well, I can't get up and say this because people will no longer pay me pay serious attention to me, and so they're not going to hear anything else I have to say, so I still want to have some sort of sounding board that someone will be able to speak, so maybe I'll just sort of stay away from these things and talk about other topics that might be more, you know, practical or relevant to this this generation. But they don't speak much about the, the judgment or the wrath of God. But, you know, I look at the reaction in our society at this time with the reaction that took place two, three hundred years ago any time there was a calamity and the way the ministers with one voice said the same thing. They interpreted the, the judgment of God the same way. There was, there was no doubt what was going on. These ministers, no matter where you went, these ministers were clear. You know, this is an act of God. God is speaking to this generation. God has raised his hand up. He's displeased with our sins and iniquities. Well, on that line, would call men to repent, to take a serious look at their life. Those who did not know Christ, they were called to come to Christ and repent and lay hold of Him for hope. Not today. It's hard to hear anything about that today. Instead, you hear ministers, and I'm not denigrating what they're doing. Ministers, well, let's give hope, let's give comfort, let's give peace to the... And those are good. Those are good things. We do that. Ministers speak comfort to people and, and try to you know instill hope. Those are all legitimate. But let's make sure that in the process of doing that, we don't minimize the other, which is what tends to happen. Now, what I want to do in the time I have left, I want to kind of amplify what Paul has said in Romans 1. Let's back up there. Here's what he says. Let's take a look at this. Romans chapter 1. And down there at verse 18 again. So he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, first off, what is this wrath of God? What is it? Well, let's put it to you this way. It's a reaction of God's being against evil. That's what it is. The wrath of God is a reaction of God's being, His nature, against evil. It's an outflow of his justice. The wrath of God, in a sense, is the execution of God's justice. When God is said to inflict wrath, what he is doing is vindicating his justice, vindicating his rule. After all, God is the creator. Men are created beings. Therefore, God, by right of creation, can command, I should say this way, can create the kind of laws that he expects his creature to abide by. These are the rules which God says, All right, I'm, I'm God, I made you, this is how I expect you to live. When those laws are broken, God reserves the right to inflict punishment for the breaking of those laws. And it's an amazing thing to me, here in the United States and in the most civilized world, in places across the world, even uncivilized, most people do not have a problem with the law of a society being broken and then an evildoer being punished as a result. Most people do not have a problem with that concept. You know, here in the United States, we have laws on the books against murder or rape or theft or arson or, or perjury, all kinds of laws we have. Just name something that's offensive to society and we have laws on the books. And if the law is broken, then most people who have any concept of justice expect the law to be enforced. They expect punishment to be meted out. And if you did not have that, then the world would quickly descend into anarchy. If men felt free to do whatever they want without any restraint on their conduct, knowing that they could violate the laws of society at a mere whim, you'd have anarchy. You could not live in this society. You know, government is a gift from God. The very constant because it, it, it puts a restraint upon men's conduct. You know, we saw what happened in New Orleans when men are unleashed from restraints during that judgment. Now it was a week ago, wasn't it? Or two weeks. How long has it been? Two weeks. Think about what we saw, what we witnessed there in that city. I mean, it, it was it was like people just do whatever they want. I mean, it was the military, the police were scared to go into there. It was that bad. 
Now imagine that spreading across an entire society and engulfing it. That sort of violence. Imagine that. You couldn't live in a society like that. Who would want to live in a society like that? I wouldn't want to live in a society like that. What would be the point of even existing? You'd be in fear the whole time, cringing in a corner somewhere, worried who's going to get you next. So, but however, when the authorities came in and they began to enforce the law, what happened? Society cleaned up. They took the evildoers, put, locked them up, got them off the streets. They were able to go in and rescue people who needed rescuing. You know the story. So no one has a problem when it comes to society inflicting punishment for its laws being violated. However, when we turn to God and we talk about a divine governor with divine laws who reserves the right to inflict punishment upon those who break his laws, immediately we're greeted with skepticism and ridicule. As if it's some sort of strange concept. There's nothing strange about it. It would be strange if God did not vindicate his law. That's what would be strange. So the point is, Paul says it's the wrath of God. It's a personal thing. It's God himself acting. And it's God acting because something has provoked him to anger. It has provoked his wrath. In other words, God simply is not... Here's put it this way. One of the reasons we have a problem in, many, in, in, in this age in which we live in, this so-called enlightened age, is that we still, to a certain extent, carry with us the ideas from the Greek philosophers who viewed the loss of control of one's emotion as somehow repugnant. In other words, if you ever watched a person fly into a fit of rage, or you've done it yourself, which we probably all have, if we're honest, it's not a very pretty thing. Somebody loses control of their temper and just flies into a fit. Kind of an ugly thing, isn't it? So to, to the Greeks, who prided themselves, especially when you, know, when you look at some of the, philosoph the, teachers, the philosophers who taught about self-control, especially to be able to bring one's emotions under control of one's mind, that idea of, of a person losing their temper and flaring up in wrath was somewhat repugnant to their way of thinking. So... In modern day world, we think about the wrath of God. You think about this being who just sort of loses control and goes on a fit of rage and he's just swatting things and in, never in, in his sight. That's not, when we talk about the wrath of God, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that is precise, that is focused, and that is perfect. Perfect. Perfect wrath? Yes, perfect wrath because it is, a, it is the perfect answer to a violation of his laws. It is perfect justice in operation. Perfect. In other words, it perfectly fits the crime. That's something to admire. We would admire a judge who can look at various people who come before him who have been accused of crimes and found guilty and can mete out a sentence that's appropriate to the crime. We admire a judge like that. We like to have judges like that. You know, we see judges, we had one judge, I think it was Ted Poe, before he ran for Congress, who would make people carry plaques out, you know, and publicly humiliate them, which was pretty amazing. A lot of people kind of, you know, lampooned him, but you know what? The people in the community loved him. Elected him to Congress, even. They loved him. Because people were afraid to get caught doing something wrong in the jurisdiction that he presided over because they didn't want to be sentenced to that sort of punishment he was going to inflict. It had a strong restraining impulse to it. So we admire that. Well, when it comes to God's justice, it's a perfect justice. It's perfect. Perfectly fits the crime. So in a sense, even though, and, and I'm saying this, and I'm trying to say it carefully so you don't think I'm indifferent to human suffering. So even though so many people get hurt when these things happen, from God's perspective, he is glorifying his justice. So, again, we need to be sensitive to the human misery involved in this. We're not gloating in this. We're not rejoicing over this. However, it is, from God's perspective, a glorious display of his justice. So, Paul says, it's the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now, what is this? It says, how is it revealed? Well, it doesn't say, you'll notice this, it doesn't say that the wrath of God will be revealed. He's not talking about something that's going to happen in the future. That's a present tense. The wrath of God is revealed. That's present. 
is revealed. Now, when he wrote this, it was being revealed. And really, when you look at the, the tense of that in the Greek, it has an idea of is being revealed. Is being. In other words, a continuous revelation of God's wrath. Continuously. Throughout the course of history. Not just a one-time act, but something that continuously, over the course of history, has been demonstrated time and time and time again to give insight into the nature of God and the nature of His vindictive justice. Okay, now, let me give you some examples of the way God's wrath has been revealed or is being revealed. We can go back and start. We don't need to turn here. I'm just going to just listen. We can go and think about Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. The very beginning of human history that we have recorded here in the Word of God, we see God's wrath revealed from heaven. God gave a law. Don't eat from the fruit of that tree. Man violated the law. Therefore, God inflicted punishment for the violation of His law. What did He do? He basically cursed the ground. He says, now it will bear thorns and thistles that will come up. He told the woman that you'll now conceive in, in, in pain. He told her that in a sense she'd be submissive or in a lesser position than her husband. Subservient in a sense because of what happened. The divine order was that man and woman were equal. And you can look in certain portions of society, notably in the Islamic world, where the woman is more or less treated as a doormat. Part of the curse. There it is in display. And throughout history you can look at the, the role of women. Oftentimes they've been denigrated. All that goes back to the, the curse of Genesis chapter 3. Adam has to go out and, and earn his living by the sweat of his brow. God's wrath. Then we go to Cain. Of course, you know Cain killed his brother Abel. God's wrath demonstrated or revealed upon how he dealt with Cain. Set some sort of mark on him. We don't know exactly the nature of the mark, whether it was physical or we don't know what it was. But the point was he was a marked man. And God specifically singled him out for justice. Okay? There it was. And then, of course... We jump to the time of Noah. And the interesting thing about when you read Noah, and you get to this in Genesis 6, you'll see it in 6, 7, 8, and 9, where God deals with Noah. One thing that God says, He says that the, the heart, the thoughts of the minds of men, basically, because it was fully given to do evil. It was just given over. In other words, it's hard for us to conceive of what men were like in Noah's day, but... The scripture remarks, it says, the earth was filled with violence. Violence. And in my mind, that whenever you see a society in which the crime rate soars, and particularly violent crime, you are looking at a society that is ripening for judgment. Think about that. It's ripening for judgment. I mean, again, I, I, the, the scenes from New Orleans this past week just stunned me, to be honest with you. I cannot conceive of people literally firing weapons at people coming to rescue them. I cannot conceive of that. I cannot conceive how degraded that is. A human being could degrade to such a level. That's what we witnessed. But that sort of thing, and I promise you, that's not confined in New Orleans. That's not confined there. There are cities all over this nation that would probably have a similar result should something cataclysmic happen to them as well. I still to this day remember the, the riots that took place in Los Angeles after the Rodney King verdict came down. And I'll never will forget those images of the Korean shopkeepers in front of their shops with their weapons trying to protect their shops from looters because of a verdict. It's still amazing to me that some team in some city can win some sports contest, whether it's a Super Bowl or a basketball championship, and they think they celebrate, you burn the city down. I can't conceive of such a, a mentality. It's lower than an animal. Even an animal doesn't destroy its own den. But this is the kind of thing that we're, we witness to. In other words, the same thing back in Noah's day was filled with violence, corruption. Okay? Now, not only that, let me show you something else about that. Turn to Luke's Gospel. Let's look at something in Luke 17. Mark, Romans 1. We'll come back here. Look at Luke 17. Because we oftentimes we think about Noah's day, we only think about that portion of the Scripture, that the earth was filled with violence. And God, you know, God said it, He was sorry He made man. Pretty remarkable thing for Him to say. And, and He says, I will blot out man whom I have made. Blot him out. 
And we know, of course, folks, that the flood came, didn't it? And it did blot out man, except for Noah and his family. There was the wrath of God revealed. Revelation, folks, it had never, never rained before. And here was something new. But what Jesus says, speaking about this day, and again, like I said, Jesus spoke quite often about the wrath of God. Verse 26 of Luke 17, he says, Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, what was going on in the days of Noah that was so terrible? Well, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Boy, that sounds really evil. Eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. Wow. I'm guilty of eating and drinking and I've been married, so I'm there. Most of you there. Wow. Let's go see what happened in the days. What other days? Let's look at this. It says, it was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking. Well, there they are again. Uh Uh-oh, this time they're buying. Wow, they're buying? But they're selling. Oh, that's really bad. And they're planting. That's horrible. They're planting crops. And they're building things. But on the day that Lot went out in Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Now, what is so bad about those things? Well, nothing. Nothing wrong with those things. So what's the Lord saying? He didn't destroy them because they were planting their corn or building a house or getting married. There's nothing wrong with those things. Why were they destroyed? Not because they were doing these things but because these things were done without any thought of God. That's what was the problem was. In other words, these people were so busy living, doing their own thing, that there was no thought of God. God was nowhere in their thoughts. They were just going about their business. And because God was nowhere in their thoughts, even though they were in the process of doing all these things, eventually the whole society just slid into moral evil. Because when God is removed from the mind, eventually the passions of men take over and the passions of men never move upward. They always go downward. Man always degrades himself. He's capable of inventing new methods of evil. And that was what we saw in the days of Noah and we saw it in the same days of Lot. And so it can be the same in our society. And it's our warning to us, the Lord warned that generation that they had better be careful about being so busy living that they forget about God. Because without a focus on God, without with with by losing sight of God, you lose sight of the real meaning of life. And then once you lose sight of God and the real meaning of life, then you just pretty much do whatever your heart desires. And before long the whole society does that, and then the whole society begins on a path to downward decay. And eventually, what did God do? He says, well, in Noah's day, he said they were destroyed. The same thing in Lot's day. That was another thing. He goes a lot. So we had the wrath of God revealed in Abel, I mean, excuse me, with Adam and Eve, then with Cain, and then we have Noah, and then we have Babel. Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. We read about it last week. God came down and revealed his wrath there. And then we have Sodom. And I think about Sodom, and the whole thing is detailed in Genesis chapter 19 for us. And what frightens me about Sodom was the conditions that you see in Sodom are eerily similar to the conditions that you see here in many places in the United States. And I have to say, and I don't mean to be callous, but I have to say that New Orleans is a modern-day Sodom. I should say was. Now, that doesn't mean everybody in New Orleans was wicked. So don't come away with the idea, the pastor said, everybody in New Orleans is wicked. No, they're not. There's some good people there. And then they suffered. But I will say one thing. There were some very evil people there as well. As there are very evil people here in our city and anywhere else. And where we would be without the grace of God. We'd probably be in there with them. But the point is, is that when you look at Sodom, you look at the conditions that existed in there. And I think in particular, and I'm trying to be very sensitive how I say this because there's children here. But I think about the kind of crimes that were committed in Sodom provoke God to such an extent that he made a signal example of Sodom. Jesus refers to the destruction of Sodom in the Gospels. It's that powerful destruction. Jude, when he writes his epistle, speaks about Sodom. He talks about it. 
Now, it was something that was so vivid and, and it, w it was so obviously something that was done by the hand of God that it was left there as a signal example of destruction that God would hurl down on a society that went this direction. And I've got to tell you, people, I mean, I tremble for our nation because it's headed that direction. You know, we are on the verge in many places of legalizing homosexual marriage. I can't think of a higher affront to God than to do something like that. Well, in particular, what bothers me is the children. You've heard me speak about this before, but the children who get adopted into that sort of perverse relationship, what it does to them. And, I, and you know, God said, Jesus said very plainly, you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and you thrown into the sea. Jesus said that. The kind, considerate, sweet Jesus who never offends. He said it. You cause one of these little ones to stumble. It would have been better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown into the sea. Now, folks, i got to tell you, any society that begins to hurt its little children is a society that is greatly provoking God. I particular, I read about, and again, I'm being very careful because the children out here, you adults fill in the blanks here. You know, you can think through this. But we read the stories about what happens to some of these children on the news, some of the things that happen by these predators that are out there. It's, a, it's appalling to me. It used to be something, a story like that, you just didn't happen, happen all that often. Now it seems like they pop up every day. You have something like this. And I think, what kind of perversion can get a hold of somebody to do this? To destroy the life of a little child. To gratify themselves in some sort of sick way. What can you, I mean, think about those lives of those children who are scarred forever as a result of something like that. And you tell me that God doesn't, isn't provoked when he sees that? Well, if he's not, and he's not a God of justice, then we might as well just take this Bible, throw it away, and close the doors here and just go somewhere else. Because I would lose my sanity if I didn't believe that somehow God will requite these people what they've done. So, folks, listen. He not only did it with there, he went to Sodom. I mean, we could go example after example. How about Dathan, Korah, and Abiram? Remember them? The earth opened up and swallowed them. Think about the history of Israel. You know, I've got to submit to you. Without, If you do not believe the concept of the wrath of God, I've got to submit to you. You might as well just read the prophets as if they're gibberish. Because the prophets don't make any sense unless you understand the concept of the wrath of God. Jeremiah getting up there and warning the city that he loved so much about the impending doom that was coming their way unless they would repent. That there's no wrath of God. Jeremiah was just delusional. He was, delu he was delusional. Same thing with Nahum. Same thing with Jonah going through the city of, of Nineveh 130 years before Nahum went over there. Yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Ah, this guy's on drugs. He's high. He doesn't know what he's saying. Obviously, the king believed him. The people believed him. They repented. Jesus said they repented. He said, a greater than Jonah is here. And he says, as a matter of fact, because Nineveh repented and you didn't, you'll be more liable in the judgment. So you think about that. Then you read Jeremiah 25 and you see all these various nations. God says to Jeremiah, take this cup of the anger of the Lord and pass it to these nations and let them drink it. And he goes on and lists almost every nation in the world at that time in that area. He goes on and lists Syria and I mean and, and just blam 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 Edom and, and just read Jeremiah 25. One nation after another, pass this cup of my wrath and let them drink deeply of it. And then he raised up Nebuchadnezzar and he sent Nebuchadnezzar through and just leveled everything. Just leveled it. He called Nebuchadnezzar my war club. That's what he called him, Jeremiah fifty. My hammer. Amazing. God said, he's my war club. I sent him. All, from the human perspective, it was just an army that came in and invaded things and tore everything up. Bad. God said, no, that's my weapon. I did it. And that's exactly, folks, what he did with his own people. You remember when he spoke to Abraham in, in Genesis 15. He said something to Abraham. He said, look. Your descendants, I'm going to give you a great number of descendants. And he said, they're going to be in prison, in captivity. 
He said, but I'll bring them out with a mighty hand and I'll stretch them out and I'll give them all this land. And this land that he was going to give them was the place where the Amorites were dwelling. And one thing God said, and which is we ought to really keep in mind, he said, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. It's not full. Think about that. In other words, it's like a cup and it's filled with water. And one drop after another just kept dropping into this cup. And each time it dropped in, the water level began to raise. I think it took several centuries by the time Abraham and Moses came on the scene. But by then, the Amorites had filled up the measure of their sins, which is what Jesus used the expression to the Pharisees, hearkening right back to what he told Abraham. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the Pharisees, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. Fill it up. And when it's full, then the hand of God descended. And in that manner, he used his people to go into the land of Canaan and annihilate that civilization. Which is sometimes we read, boy, that seems harsh. I mean, we read about these, and I, it's, it's almost comical reading the explanations that some scholars try to put on the destruction that God ordered the Israelites to inflict upon the Amorites and the Canaanites and that whole group. But, you know, God said, listen, I want you to kill everything in sight. Men, women, old men, young men, infants. Well, that seems harsh, doesn't it, to us? But what was God doing? The iniquity of the Amorites was full and he used his own people as the sword of judgment. And they went in and they were not to spare anything. Those people had become so vile that God didn't want anything left of them. He did not want their influence to remain. And, what, and he told them, if you spare them, basically they're going to come back and bite you because you'll adopt their ways and when you adopt their ways, my anger will be kindled against you. And as I drove them out of the land, I'll drive you out of the land. And that's exactly what happened. Bad company corrupts good morals, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. That's what we have to be careful about. We live in a society that's so decadent. And I use the word decadent. That's exactly what's becoming in this, of this society. And thankfully... At the same time, we see people who still have kind hearts and are generous and there's still goodness in this nation, thankfully. But boy, alongside this goodness, there is decadence as well. And we have to be careful that we do not allow that to corrupt us. We have got to be careful because if we are not on guard, it will. It will influence us. It absolutely will. Again, it's Exodus 21 says, you shall not follow a multitude to do evil. I don't care how many people do it. If God says no, that's it. That's all we need to know. God said no, that's the end of it. That's the end of discussion. It's the same thing when we talk about the wrath of God. But we don't need to sit there and try to prove to somebody that the wrath of God is real. Any more than we need to prove that the gospel is real. We, it's not our business to prove that it's real. It's our business simply state it. That's it. How can I prove the gospel? I can't prove it. I can say the word of God says it. I can declare it, but I can't prove it to somebody. That's up to the Holy Spirit. He has to convince them. But we're not called upon to either prove the gospel or to prove the reality of the, or the wrath of God. Paul wasn't. He just stated it. This said was obvious. This stated it. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You know, you see the things that took place there in Jeremiah, and then we come into the New Testament, we see it in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, we see all these bowls of wrath poured out on the earth. There's the wrath of God being revealed, and they take the form of droughts and famines and pestilence and war and civil unrest and all the things that, that, that plague mankind, illnesses, Plagues, I mean, we think about it. It's hard for us to imagine. But during the time Luther wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that we sang this morning, the Black Death was, de was devastating Europe. There are some accounts that between one quarter and one third, now that's a pretty big number, one third of the population of Europe were destroyed, were wiped out by this plague. And it was just carried by flea bites from, from, from rats. They would bite a rat that was infected and they would bite a human being and they would get the disease. I think it was a bacterial infection, if I remember correctly. But they never cure for it. Think about that. One out, even if you use the lower number, one out of four people, if we were to take this room, 
25% of us would be gone. If we used a higher number, 33% would be gone. One out of three, just gone, dead. The book of Revelation speaks about those sort of things. I'm watching right now with great interest this thing called the bird flu. The Asian bird flu, which some of you may not know about. This thing is getting serious. The health authorities are minimizing it as they always do. Talk it down, play it down, no big deal. We're, oh, we've got plenty of vaccine now. We're trying to get going. If you, trust, if you think the government's going to save you folks, you better wise up because you saw a perfect example of what happens when the government tries to save anybody in New Orleans. Here's the point I'm making. A lot of people forget it during the, the uh, I think it was 1919, that they called the Spanish influenza broke out. That killed millions of people. Millions across the world. Some of our guys who fought in World War I picked it up. And they brought it back to the States as well. I mean, it was an epidemic. And there's the, the fear among certain authorities that this bird flu that keeps popping up, it started over in Asia, and then it's, now it's in China, and you see it spreading across the Caucasus region. Russia now has reported it. Germany's afraid that it's going to come in there. So far, it hasn't made the transition from birds to humans yet. But they're also worried about it making a transition to pigs, to swine, because the swine physiology is so much like the human physiology, and that the virus could get there and then jump from there to the humans. And I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to terrify. I'm just trying to say the potential for all kinds of devastation is out there. That's all I'm trying to tell you. And the point I'm trying to make in this is that we think because we have all this learning, science and technology, that we can inoculate ourselves against the judgments of God. And that therefore we don't need to worry about the wrath of God. We don't need to submit and humble ourselves underneath His hand. And somehow we can just you know, tighten up our belts a bit and suck it up and just do all, just go on forward and everything's going to be fine. Don't worry, science will find a cure for this. It's like the same thing with the AIDS virus, as bad as that is. And again, I'm not minimizing this and I'm not trying to minimize human suffering. But look how many people that thing has killed. Think about South Africa. I think there's some, some estimates say 40% of South Africa is HIV positive. 40% of the people. I can't imagine that. I mean, we have no idea what goes on outside of our own little narrow world at times. But folks, there's all kinds of potential for human suffering and tragedy and misery to take place in our world. And what we have to view is we have to say either we see God's wrath being revealed from heaven or it's just something the laws of nature and this planet sort of running on its own. I would like to believe that there's a God, an all-wise God behind it. And that He has called us, who are His sons and daughters, to faith in Christ, to be holy and godly in the midst of this world in which we live. And that the only place of shelter from this wrath is in His Son. That's it. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. God has set Him forth publicly as a propitiation in His blood. A propitiation to avert His wrath. In Isaiah, God said, I have no wrath. Speaking about the generation and the time that would come. Those were his people. Why does he have no wrath toward his people? Because Christ took that wrath. That's the final demonstration that, of the wrath of God revealed from heaven. People don't like to think of it that way, but God revealed himself through all history with these judgments and plagues that descended on humankind. But one of the most graphic displays of the wrath of God was at Calvary. People think, you know, the love of God was on display at Calvary. Absolutely it was. But what they forget is that the suffering that Christ went through was beneath the wrath of God. That's what he was suffering there. He wasn't suffering for his sins. He wasn't suffering because he was some confused rabbi who had messianic dreams of glory. He was suffering there because he underwent the wrath of God on behalf of his people. That's why he suffered. God took his wrath and said, you want to see what it's like and how I feel about sin? And took it and sent it and hurled it right into his own son. And Christ suffered it for us. And he, God says then, you put your faith in, in me. You cling to me. You come to me. And God's wrath will no longer touch you. Why? Because it spent its volley on him. That's the message that we have. It's a glorious message to save us from the wrath of God. Well, folks, to, to think about this, 
all of history is leading to this final day in which the wrath of God will be revealed in its entirety. All of it. God will do is remove all vestiges of evil. And folks, when he, when he displays his wrath, it's not going to be to correct at that time. There's nothing corrective about the final day. It's retribution. You know, we like to think of you know, people going to prison, they ask a man, are you a rehabilitated man? Oh, I've been rehabilitated. Rehabilitated. Well, we think of the, you know, the, prison, the, the penal system to rehabilitate someone. Folks, God's wrath is not to rehabilitate. It's to punish. That's what we need to understand. That final day, it is vindictive judgment. He is glorifying His justice. It's retribution to evildoers. There's nothing corrective about it. And that's a concept that we really need to tremble beneath. And think about that. That's a solemn day. That's a very solemn day. You know, men may congratulate themselves and pat themselves on the back for now and think, boy, things are fine with me. I'm, go ahead, God. I can stand up to God, whatever. But to, to imagine standing before a being and being called to, like God and being called to give an account a being of such glory and greatness and power whose mere word is fiat. That's it. And again, I've told many times before, you know, we have a lot of things that we can do, but let me close on this thought. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, and even to this day, if a bolt of lightning strikes nearby the house and a rush of air comes in and makes a loud clap of thunder and the house rattles, and, and I'll tell you what, that's, that's fearful. And I don't mind telling you, I don't care who you are, but when the thunder grabs a hold of the house and just starts shaking it, it's, it's unnerving. You know, you have dog, those of you who have dogs, the dogs take off, they run under the bed, they whimper, you know, the kids come crying to you. Why, it's fearful, isn't it? It's an all-inspiring thing. When you read in the book of Revelation about the judgment seat of God, it's sounds of thunder emanating from that place. Think about that. You think about the, the, and, and how awe-inspiring, how fearful a place that must be. You know, the stoutest sinner, the stoutest-hearted sinner in that day will tremble in fear. I mean, those who mock God the loudest and were the, you know, what seemed to be nothing bothered them, they will cower in that day. And it says they will look for a rock to hide under. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne in the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. What a seemingly oxymoron, moronic comment. Wrath of the Lamb. A wrathful Lamb. Amazing, isn't it? But the Lamb spurned becomes a lion. That's what we see. The Lion of Judah. Well, let's just thank the Lord for what He's done for us. And let's live that way. Let's live to honor Him. Okay? Keep these things in mind. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for what You teach us and You reveal to us and demonstrate and show us. And Lord, calls us to be like David when David said, My flesh trembles for fear of Thee. I am afraid of Thy judgments. And indeed, Lord, as You said through the book of Jeremiah, who would not fear Me? And You think about, Lord, how You place the boundary for the seas upon which they cannot cross over. Lord, and when You remove the boundary and let loose the waves, how the destruction comes upon mankind. It's by your word they're held back. Lord, indeed, who could stand before your presence as Moses said, once you are angry? Lord, thank you for Christ. Thank you for he who took the wrath of God for us, who bore what we deserve, who did it out of love to us, and Lord, who loves us to this day and who cares for us and shelters us and keeps us and preserves us. And even, Lord, when we offend you and sin against you, who intercedes for us, in front of you and avert your wrath from us. Thank you, Lord, for Christ. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.